the deep the deep stuff 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 teaching the deep the deep stuff 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 teaching teaching with guest Elizabeth Mead. Okay, <laughs> so you've been from your biography. You've been around the world. You've taught, and you've been an artist in residence in London, Japan, uh, Iceland. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, all over. Was there a moment in time where you discovered you'd be a teacher? It's a, it's a really good question. Um, it's a little bit complicated. Um, I had the most amazing advisor in graduate school, and he's a, and still is, a remarkable teacher. I mean, he's retired, but in a sense, he's the kind of person who's still teaching, I think. And he was, he was my model, and I didn't think I could ever be as good as him. Um, and I wasn't sure that I could teach, and, and I, was, I was a teaching assistant to him. But my university believed strongly in the focus on our studies, and we literally were just assistants. So unlike some R1 institutions where you would be in charge of the class on your own, I wasn't. But he would do things like, I, <laughs> I've read this uh, uh, book by uh, uh, Francois Leotard, and I, th- I went to him this one afternoon. I said, oh, my God, this, this is amazing. Have you, have you read Driftworks? You've, you've got to read this. And he said, oh, that's perfect. You can present that at the senior seminar tonight. And I thought, oh, my God. No, I can't do that. You know? And um, I, but I, I, I did. And so the day that I was finishing setting up my thesis exhibition, I, I went to a, a remarkable school with really fabulous people. And the, um, our office admin person came down the hall to the museum where I was setting up, and she said, um, this just came in. You need to apply for it. And it was... Uh, a position had opened at Colgate, and so I was like, "Oh my God, I don't think I can't." I can't. <laughs> anyway, I did, and uh, and I got an on-site interview. I mean, I had literally stepped out the door of graduate school, and again, a very amazing group of people who were very kind to me. It was incredibly intense. It was two days where they literally had me scheduled so tightly. At one point, I asked permission to go to a restroom, and someone waited outside the restroom for me, and you know. Um, but, but obviously someone had quit the last minute. And, uh, it's, uh, ultimately, I didn't get the job. Um, but uh, they were so kind that they, they didn't want to leave me a voicemail. They waited till they could get me in person and, and told me um, the reason was this other person just had all this other experience. And I was like, totally, I know, I have none. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so then the following year, I got a job as a visiting person at the University of Chicago. And I was terrified and uh, at that time, um, their studios were called the Midway Studios, and they were an old Victorian house. And I remember, and I was responsible for two classes. Uh, one was in sculpture, and one was drawing, which definitely I'd never taught before. Um, but something amazing happened, and I remember standing, it was about, I don't know, maybe the third or fourth week, and I was about to go into the studio, and I stood outside, and I just looked up at this guy, and I was like, look, I don't know what's happening, but whatever it is, please keep it going. <laughs> you know? And I ended up having this really great experience, and um, I think it was a... At, no, at that point, I was, frankly, I was still ambivalent about it. I, was, I still didn't believe I could actually do it. And um, What was it that made you think that you couldn't do it? What, that I could do it. That you, was there a point where you said, yeah, I've got this? I think I think when I reflected maybe after after my time there, um, because then I then I did just kind of jump into it. I was really fortunate. I mean, I got jobs right away. I was in a tenure track job and got tenure um, like straight out of the the blocks. You know, it just it just all clicked. Um, I know you know you know th- there's still days I walk in there and I think I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not very good at this. Um, so I don't, I don't think my self-doubt has ever gone away. Hmm. Um, but I have these amazing moments. And um, I, mean, I guess if I step back, I have to say, well, something's happening. So my, one of my uh, um, honor students from a f- several years back has decided to apply to graduate school. And she's been accepted to two and waitlisted at one. And really good programs. And so, you know, and she's texting me going, okay, they, they just made me an offer, but this financial offer isn't as good, and what do I do, and how do I, you know? 
and I have to believe that I'm doing something okay, you know. <laughs> but uh, <coughs> excuse me. Do you, do you take, in in a sense, though, in the beginning of uh, your graduate uh, school experience, where you were a teaching assistant, mm-hmm. that instructor was kind of a mentor to you. Did he push? Do you feel like he pushed you beyond uh, your thinking and into a greater understanding? Was that the most helpful thing that he did? Yeah. Could you ask me the question again? Uh, the, the, the teacher, the instructor that encouraged you, you brought him um, a, pa- a, a paper or a book that you were right. reading, and he said, go teach it tonight. Right. So was that a pattern with him? Did he, did he encourage you to go beyond what your conception was of what you could do? Yeah, he, he's, um, I just talked to him a couple of weeks ago. He, uh, yeah, he helped me to believe in me, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, said things, you know, that, that to basically get out of my own way, you know. Yeah. Um, and it, but he didn't quite say it that way. He was, he was also good. I remember, you know, I, I, I went to, I applied to that school and went there because of him. I had met him before, and uh, yeah, so he was specifically the person I wanted to study with. Um, and I can remember, like, you know, you're in graduate school and, you know, it gets really intense and, you know, just feeling like, oh, my God, I don't know what I'm doing right now. I don't know what's going on. I said, Jay, I, I need to meet with you. And he'd come in and he'd sit down in the studio and he'd look around and he'd say, yeah, you're in deep guano. Good luck. <laughs> and I'd get up and leave. And he'd be like, no, wait, come back here. Um, so uh, I guess in the way that he modeled that, he also basically was showing me that I was capable of doing it. I was capable of working my way out of it. So, I, it, yeah, he, he modeled it. Mm. I mean, I, and I, I, I based my teaching or how I approach it on how he did it. And I think the single most important thing that he taught me was to, to listen, to listen to what the student has to say and what they're, what they're telling you. And, and in listening, that's when you find out what's really going on. Mm. Um, is, is, is that something that you reciprocate now? Do you, do you return that with your current students? Absolutely. I ask them. Um, I ask them for critique and evaluation all the time. Not not just to me, but like of the course of what we're doing, the approach we're taking, and in listening to them, I can I can redirect something better. I can also find out what it is that's working and not working. Um, I mean, I can certainly read a lot of it, but there's a lot of stuff. Gosh, William and Mary students are so good. Does it make sense? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like. Um, so, you know, I, I, I start the first day of um, every semester in each class I teach with two quotations. One's from Wittgenstein, who says, don't be afraid of speaking nonsense, but you must pay attention to your nonsense. And in that, I say that, you know, if, I, if you don't get something or if you have a question about something, you have to trust it and you have to believe in it. But you also have to ask it. And I promise you, the minute you do... There's going to be at least a dozen other shoulders in the room that go, oh, thank God someone asked, right? You know, that, so that happened today to me. <laughs> <laughs> I asked students what their opinions were, and I learned so much just by that question. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other one is, is uh, Samuel Beckett. I'm just an abbreviated part of it, but basically fail, fail again, fail better. Um, and so setting up an environment that allows people to know that it's okay to fail, and especially now, I mean, gosh, we we've been told that failure is not okay on any level. And if you aren't willing to risk it, you're not going to move forward, but you have to create, you have to create a space where that's okay to happen and to understand that that's part of how you build. And as long as it's better the next time, then it's just going to keep getting better. Hmm. Do you have a question? Do you have? I I feel like you did sort of answer my question a little bit, but like what you were getting at, like sort of believing that you can overcome sort of an, what feels like an insurmountable like problem, like feels like not only something that I feel as a student, but something that you might feel as a teacher as well, like trying to create that space or like figure out how to make uh, a lesson work. Like I imagine that's a, a theme that you, you probably still sort of feel to some extent. Yeah, I do. Uh, it's interesting. So this semester I designed a class, uh, it's a just topics class, uh, upper level in sculpture called um, Materiality in the Virtual World. 
because I thought we're we're here, and to, you know uh, we got to figure this out. And so I've got this really terrific group of students who you know on the first day I said, look, I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know, you know, what we're going to figure out, but we're going to figure something out. And um, I think the minute that you you invite you invite students in that way, and you tell them, that, look, we're in it together, and and I'm doing this because I think there's something here. I think that there is some way that we can find to have a haptic kind of experience within this this sorry, it's okay. virtual space. And um, and I decided that we were going to do it with um, decidedly what I would call non-materials. So all they can use, I've, I've extended it t- a tad just for structural reasons, but hot glue, fishing line, and duct tape. Because those are the three materials that right, duct tape is like, you know, if it's broken, you just duct tape it together. <laughs> And uh, fishing line, every every sculpture student always wants to hang a sculpture. Well, how are you going to hang it? What's the relationship between, you know? And the, well, I'll just put fishing line, it'll disappear. Right? <laughs> and, then, and then hot glue is like, you know, it's not glue. It's just like gum between two things, you know? Mm-hmm. But um, uh, so, so we're, we're doing that. And, and we're having some really amazing conversations. And I think we're figuring something out. I can't, I can't tell you exactly what it is just yet. But I, I feel like we're, we're really on to something. And so that's that's exciting, but that's only, I think, because I tell them that, you know, it's scary for me too, and, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to work. Nothing's certain. So I guess in a way I'm, I'm trying to, to model the way Jay modeled for me. It's, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to work. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, when I was first learning to, to cast bronze, you know, we, we, um, and he, he was casting these really large pieces, and I was assisting him. Um, you know, you can do everything just right. And for some reason, you end up with like a, 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 a little sinkhole or shrinkage. You know, most of it you can figure out, but every once in a while, the metal just does something. Mm-hmm. And so that idea that everything can be spot on, everything can be absolutely right. You can go through your checklist too million times, and and it just it just didn't work that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's important. I think it's it's more important now maybe than when I was a student. It's, it's, it sounds like the process of discovery is a major theme in how you teach and also the curiosity that comes with that. Yeah. Because you have to have that curiosity to want to discover and also the bravery, the courage to know it may fail. Right. It may not turn out as anything. Yeah. I think, you know, I was such a, I, I was such a, <laughs> I, I, I went to art school as an undergrad, mm-hmm. you know, I had an inter. They accepted me. Um, I, I, I had a full fellowship in, in graduate school. They paid me basically to go to school, and still I waited for that day when someone came and knocked on the door and said, "Thank you, Elizabeth Mead. Get out of here. We wanted the other one. It wasn't you." You know. Um, Was it the imposter syndrome? Oh, d- oh, definitely. And still, you know, I, I like um, the past year. I mean, it's been a terrible year professionally. Has been kind of amazing for me. And, you know, I still find myself kind of going like, ah, oh, they, they don't really mean that. <laughs> they don't, you know, it's like, yeah, yeah, it doesn't go away. I mean, it doesn't mean that I can't see, I, I can be objective. I can step back and say, okay, like, wait, let's just look at the evidence, you know. But it doesn't, it doesn't always feel that way. But I also think because, like, as an undergrad, I remember, I remember learning to weld. And for whatever reason, I got out of taking the class where they taught you how to weld but I wanted to weld anyway. And so I had one of my professors show me. Um, and where I was, the school I was at, the metal shop was a whole different building. And, you know, you could be out there working and no one was out there with you. And um, I was terrified of lighting the torch. And so I did with an oxyacetylene torch. You know, it's that big boom. And, and it makes a big pop when you, you, know, you, you light it. And uh, I would, for the first, I don't know, two months, I think, I was welding, I would wait until someone came in and I'd say, you know, I've never done this before. Would you mind just standing there while I, you know, and, and just, you know, to, to, to sort of build up my courage. Um, and the same thing with like arc welding, you know, that I, I had this unrational fear of electricity. <laughs> like, like, like I know rationally that I'm not going to complete that circuit, but somehow if I held that on while I was tacking it in place, that that was going to happen. Um, so I think those things are what... Um, Help me to teach people who find all of that. I mean, the equipment I work with is intimidating. I'm pouring metal that's over 2,000 degrees, you know, and it's right there, and you know, you're sopping wet. It's it's 
it's tough physical stuff and it's loud and um are, be, are, yeah. are the materials what grounds you as an instructor as an artist i would love to because there's so many brilliant ideas you've you've brought into this what what do you think grounds you in your teaching and in your art is it the materials well, that's interesting because the materials I'm using right now are so <laughs> so much opposite. Like bronze, I'm, I'm working with uh, paper. I'm making these paper forms that I'm photographing. Um, what grounds me? I think it's interesting because you know I, I I moved most of my stuff to work at home. I, I just I visit the studio like when no one's around, but. Um, that I'm 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 amazed by really dumb simple things. Um, so these forms are uh, they're very simple. They're, the, the thing that interests me initially is that you can take something flat and with just the slightest manipulation or gesture, you can create something that's entirely other. And um, you know, so I've got a bunch of these things sitting in my home office. You know, and they're all around. And this one area that has it, the way the morning light comes in, especially like since we've had sun the last few days, like, it, it stops me completely. I mean, physically stops me, and I stand there and just go like, that's just so amazing to me. It's just this whole world that I can fall into. Um, and how that relates to my teaching, I think it gets back to that curiosity that, that I'm sorry, I'm doing that. Um, uh, where you don't. <laughs> um, that I want, I want students to be curious about the world. I want them to see that just in the way that like that that headset is sitting on the table, that like this whole this whole thing you can fall into if you if you really spend the time to look at it and think about it. Um, you know the way something just turns a corner, uh, or the way that we can actually in all. Th- the physicality of all this, and I've always thought of myself as an object maker that in a sense, and this is kind of what my current project is, is doing, is that we can never actually know something. So the paper forms I'm making, I photograph, and I don't, um, I don't, I don't light them. It's all natural light. Um, I don't necessarily, I mean, I, I pose them, you know. Um, but I don't, um, I don't crop the image. I don't um, alter it in Photoshop or, or anything else, and it's an absolute record of that particular moment. And if I keep shooting that piece for a while or on a different day, that I'm never going to have that single moment again in exactly the same way. Mm. And the thing about the photographs is uh, they're an absolute record, and yet there have been times when I can't figure out which sculpture goes with which photograph. Mm. Or recently, a series that I um, I did... I thought there were four photo- four sculptures to go with this series of eleven photographs, and in fact, there were only three i miss I misattributed one of them, mm-hmm. um, which I thought just kind of drove the idea of the project home even more, but the gallery person was kind of upset with me mm-hmm. <laughs> there's, a, there's a gallery that that asked to show the whole series with with the sculptures mm-hmm. and and I thought, wow, well, I shouldn't be upset I mean. <laughs> That's kind of the point that I'm, I'm making here is that you can never actually know something. But anyway, I feel like I'm rambling at this point. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's it's it's, it's wonderful. Um, I have one more question. Mm-hmm. Do you have a, another question, or are you good? Go ahead. Okay. <coughs> the 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 idea of believing in the question. Mm-hmm. Tell me about that. Like, how do you? What does what does that mean to you? Oh, this is interesting because I'm working with this other group. Um, we're talking about this. Um, I just had my students read this uh, uh, chapter called Tacit Knowing by uh, Michael Polanyi. Um, asking the question, I think, is also finding the question. Because if you can ask the question, then you sort of know what the thing is already. And so it's finding finding a way to formulate what the inquiry is what the, what the question's really about um, I think I think that's that's it yeah yeah it's brilliant Wow thank you do you feel like you have 
inspiration that sort of comes like sort of in the moment, like you just sort of this question pops into your head? Or are these questions that have sort of been percolating over a long time? Like, is this a, is this paper project something that you've been thinking about for years and maybe just getting to now? Or is this something that sort of, you sort of go with the flow with more in the moment? Um, it's really funny because you find, I mean, I've been working for, God, like 35 years now, 40 years. <laughs> and um, you think you're asking a different question. <laughs> And you think you're doing something different, mm -hmm. but um, in the end, what you discover eventually is that you just sort of circle back to the same things. And you kind of ask the same question, but in different ways or with different parts of it taking on greater importance. So the paper pieces that I'm doing right now actually came about as a total fluke. Um, I was trying to, I was doing these really large scale papers and uh, papers, drawings on the paper. And it's Williamsburg, and the pa and it was a very subtle, subtle drawing, and the paper was buckling, mm. and so I had this idea if I, you know, there's um an, something called archival Tyvek, which you use in bookmaking, and I thought, well, that's got some rigidity to it. If I back it with that, that'll probably, that'll straighten it out, and um, it didn't, um, because <laughs> because at 12 feet, you know, a piece. Of, so I called the paper conservator at CW, and she. <laughs> She said, you just need to embrace the paperness of the paper, <laughs> which I thought was such like a Heideggerian thing to say that I, I kind of loved it. So, um, so I thought, okay, fine. And I took, the, took it down and rolled it up. <laughs> and, uh, um, but then I had this piece of paper around that had Tyvek on it. And I'd been um, doing this series of folded pages that related to a book. And I, it's, it, I can go on and on about this. Anyway, long story short. Um, for most of my professional life, I worked in plaster, and it was it started with um, expandable metal lath, which again, I was flat, and so with the slightest of gesture, I would manipulate it and create these forms, and then it built up layers of plaster, and in between each layer, I'd completely pigment it, hmm. but then I'd sand it back and follow it back. So what I wanted was the kind of quality of, you know, like your, your veins coming through your skin. Mm -hmm. um, the way that I made those is exactly. With, with the exception of the plaster part, but exactly the way that I'm making the paper pieces. So that they're, they're held together with string. Uh, so I just tie off the string. And it's so in the same way that I tied off with bailing wire, the um, expandable metal lath. Um, the things, that, there's a series of things that have always been important uh, for me. One is being completely absorbed into it, either into a world or, or kind of physically and peripherally in your vision, which is why my drawings tend to get really large or you go in really tight. Mm -hmm. um, but also how, how the work of art orients you in relation to it. So like even the photographs that I've been doing, I think of them as objects um, rather than just matting them. And even the ones that do get matted and framed, there's a space in between. Um, I'm using a double uh, ply mat because I want that, that sort of stepping in. Um, and then in the digital ones, you know, there's a, a weight frame around it, um, but then there's a space into it so that I'm always setting up the way that you enter into it. Um, so that's that's always been present. Like even in the, um, even when I was working like uh, in like welded steel and, and things like that, um, like how that uh, figure sort of entered the space and occupied the same space as you. And... Um, yeah, so I think at the core, all this stuff kind of always remains the same. That's so cool. I just really think, I feel like asking similar questions, but using such different materials must, like I imagine that would help me appreciate those materials, like own personalities a little bit more, mm -hmm. like by, by being able to compare them like that. Yeah, well, actually what's been super interesting about the paper, because like, and the thing is, is that in the photographs, I mean, you're, you're aware that it's just paper and it's string and it's dumb and it's expendable and, you know, it's kind of fleeting. And even when I worked in plaster, I mean, it was kind of intentional that it was kind of a non-art material, mm. right? So that the material had to sort of go beyond its own materiality to, you know, assert something other. Um, the paper is uh, a paper that I've drawn on for years. But the minute that you put the Tyvek on the back of it, it tautens it a little bit. And so it changes the surface tension on the paper side. And so suddenly this, this paper that like I always thought was beautiful, um, I can now see 
differences in like the the way that it relates to skin. You know, it becomes more porous. Mm. Um, and, and and what's what's been really interesting is there's um structurally uh, there's only a certain size you can work up to, and then you start losing that surface tension. Mm-hmm. And the minute you lose that surface tension, it really you can th- there's two of them that are larger. That um, I look at them when I walk past and I thought, oh, the poor things are just kind of like, oh, it's like they're just side the life out of them. Um, so yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. You you discover these amazing things about just the material alone. Mm-hmm. And and when you're working with sculpture, you've got to marry together the material, the form, you know, the scale of it. All those things have to just sort of unite and become one. And that's 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 the really exciting part. Wow. Yeah. I think we're good. I appreciate this a lot. Um, my only other question is that can you can you speak what your questions are that when you approach the work? Can, can you say, like, are there certain, is there a theme of question? Is there a, just a set of questions? Is it only one or two that you're trying to discover to answer to? with all these different materials and mediums and ideas? I think ultimately I want to, I want to create something that someone just is absorbed into. I don't want to tell, tell you what to think. I don't want to tell you what to do. I don't want to tell you what to believe in. I just want to create a space um, that just lets you let go of and I, uh, you know, like for me, sometimes it's, you know, I can't, I actually can't function with a lot of chaos around me. Um, it's kind of interesting, you know, <laughs> like I, I teach sculpture, which is really loud, noisy, and chaotic. <laughs> um, but like in terms of my studio, um, because I haven't been in there except you know, sporadically, and I've been like throwing things in and then grabbing things and bringing them back to my house. It's a complete disarray, and I needed to go in and do something the other day, and I, I just I could I had to just organize some of it because I, I just I literally can't function. So I think, too, um, that they are on some level about creating a certain kind of calm and order. Um, it so- <coughs> excuse me, sorry. It sounds like your work is very meditative, very zen. There's something about getting past the thought and into the space. Uh, that I hear from you. Mm-hmm. It, it's almost like a, what you'd find in a Zendo or in the philosophy of Zen. I don't know if that's something that, does that appeal to you in any way? Does medit- is your work meditative? Um, do you mean when I'm working or do I think that way for someone who's... who's no, I think, uh, do you find that um, a person seeing your work and incorporating it or ingesting it is a meditative, can be a meditative experience for them? Um, I would hope so, but I don't, I don't, I can't say if. But it's not your intent to, to make it that. It's more in your. I don't know. I, haven't, I don't know that I've thought about it in terms of it being meditative. Um, but I could see where it would seem like that that's a concern. Well, thank you. Thank you. That was really it was lovely talking to you both. <laughs> I love it. Very deep. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I yeah. love this stuff. God's good. Oh, the sound? <laughs> it's really fun, <laughs> <Yes>. right? <laughs> totally. It brings you into it. Like. No, I, I know. Well, you know, I...